Let's talk about Minecraft. I'm sure some of you have seen this video. It's a pretty good video if I do say so myself. First, I, I want to express how awesome the insane amount of interaction and support has been from that video. It's meant so much to me. I received a ton of comments on this video and thousands of people have subscribed to my channel because of it. And I'm extremely grateful for that. Truly, you're all helping me make this YouTube thing a feasible career, which is more than I could have asked for. It's crazy that as an audience, you guys can turn the geek factor from being some random guy's small channel into a real show that can reach so many people. But what is this YouTube channel? What is my goal with it? I mean, sure, it's an art form, and as I've said before, art can exist solely for the sake of existing, but I think it's clear that my channel and most channels for that matter were created to do more than just simply exist. They're created with some kind of goal in mind. Now, you might be confused about what this has to do with Minecraft and <laughs> progression, but just hang in there with me, okay? I promise. But I do this because I want two things. One, I selfishly want to be heard. You know, that's that's like half the reason most people do videos. I want my videos to reach other people. And then, and then this is number two, I want people to use them as a launch pad for their own ideas or inspiration. Still, I have to ask myself, why? Why do I want people to be inspired by the work that I do? Why do I want people to feel inspired by my work to create their own art? I think it's because of how I was inspired to create my own art. I have total freedom in how I want to present my art, which is pretty amazing. I think everyone deserves to experience the feeling of creative spark that inspired me to make these goofy videos. That being said, it can be hard to work on a video and have it go nowhere. It's difficult to avoid equating a lack of views or likes or comments or money to, to bad art. That's the nature of YouTube though. Sometimes a video may flop and I get no money, but hey, that Mario U video is still a damn good video. You should go watch it. Changing gears though, today I want to talk about a game that has given me the freedom to do whatever I wanted in the same way that YouTube has. A game that has inspired me to create and to do my own art. That game is, of course, Terraria! <laughs> Okay, sorry, bad joke. Let's talk about Minecraft. I want to say right off the bat that this video is in no way a redaction of the points I made in my previous video on Minecraft's progression. More so, I want to explore Minecraft's progression a little deeper with this video. In my original video, I stated that I was judging Minecraft purely as a survival sandbox and not so much as a building game or as a, as a platform to do your own things. And I think this was a bit misguided, maybe short-sighted maybe? So much of Minecraft's progression is in service or directly linked to building and designing your own experiences. To that extent, I think I was unfair in my analysis of the game's main progression. Yes, it literally is as simple as mining wood, stone, iron, diamond, and then netherite, but now I'm beginning to think that there is much more progression going on within the mind of the player than in the game. And that's important, and unfortunately it's something that I didn't really take into account in my first go around. So today, I want to talk you through Minecraft's progression, again, from a few key perspectives, and then talk about it from a new and hopefully improved viewpoint. I will touch on some of the solutions and issues I had previously mentioned, but with additional commentary. At the end of this video, I plan to address what I consider a much bigger problem with Minecraft, maybe even the biggest. It's a perspective that I think may be a bit surprising. So once again, let's talk about Minecraft's progression. You see that? You just witnessed the start of a great adventure. This player has just taken his first steps toward a journey that can be about almost anything he wants. From here, what happens is entirely up to his imagination. Now, I want you to think for a minute about the significance of this moment. Chopping down the first tree. I'll give you a second. What does that tree represent? This tree, my friends, is the beginning of whatever this player plans to do. The tree is a catalyst. Everything that will be created in this world stems from this single tree. The choice to punch that tree is the choice to begin. Dozens and hundreds of ideas and hours of game time may arise because of this. Mega builds, or maybe just a simple cottage. Trying to collect all of the armor trims, or maybe just a couple. Perhaps this player will create a machine that does all of the work for him, or maybe not. Whatever happens, this single moment is the beginning of it all. That tree's sacrifice is the birthplace of creativity, and therefore, 
all the things that come from it can be seen as honoring what the tree allowed the player to do, no matter how insignificant or unrelated it may seem. Ah yes, our player has just crafted their first set of tools. The tree is still with them. These tools will assist the player in building the foundation of what happens next. With this simple wooden pickaxe, the player will go on to create another pickaxe, maybe mine some stone and make a furnace, and get some coal to light his way. It's really up to him. After finding some stone, he uses the remaining sticks to create better stone tools, which he can then use to mine faster. With this, our player sets his sights out to gather a little food. Hey, after all that hard work, I'd begin to feel a little hungry too. After killing some sheep, our player crafts a campfire and settles down just before the night falls. A good, solid first day. As our player is building his house, he ventures around a little bit and finds some strange rocks. This stuff is iron. He wants to look for more of it. Tons of it, really. Maybe he can build a castle, maybe he'll find a new way to travel, or maybe he'll just keep it as a memorial for the first days on this world. It's up to him. As our player finds more and more iron, he stumbles across big and exciting caves. He finds himself inside of an old abandoned mine shaft. Some torches still light the way, but soon he finds a pale blue ore. Diamonds. This is a magical moment. The number of opportunities the player has just created for himself is endless. New pickaxes, new armor, new weapons, new places to go, this is it! While exploring, our player may stumble across old portal-like structures that have been left to ruin. He recalls a conversation he had with a friend who claimed that a diamond pickaxe can mine obsidian, and so he ventures into the deep, fighting off dangerous monsters as he does. Once he has obsidian, he completes the structure and uses the flint and steel he found to light the portal, making way to a whole new dimension. Tons of new blocks and ideas emerge from this dimension. Over time, he learns to build more. He learns to build better. What was once a lonely little house has become a little town, complete with a couple of farms and a few houses for villagers. From here, our player ventures across the depths of the nether, finding his way into bastions and fortresses alike. Little does he know, all of this hard work has led him to a very specific item, the Eye of Ender. Once he has crafted these Eyes of Ender, our player finds himself following one as it soars into the air, until it eventually disappears into the ground. After lots of mining and lots of searching, he finds himself in a stronghold, and before he knows it, the end portal is lit. This is it. The end of his adventure. All of this hard work has finally paid off. The battle begins. Our player shoots aimlessly at the dragon, occasionally hitting it, but the dragon seems to be invincible. Then, after some time, he realizes those strange beams coming from the crystals atop the pillars seem to be healing the dragon. He can shoot a couple with his bow, but some are simply out of reach or something's covering them. He'll have to build. As a dragon soars through the air, our courageous player climbs up the towers and destroys the remaining crystals. Now it's just a matter of defeating the dragon. Through much dedication and strategy, our player finally strikes down the Ender Dragon, and thus their adventure comes to a close. Except not really. In fact, this might just be the beginning. With the dragon out of the way, our player can now find Elytra and Shulka boxes, two necessary items for expanding his base and expanding exploration. From here, he uses these tools to build up more and more things. He could finally build that castle he's been thinking of, or build a whole town, or simply explore new parts of the world he hasn't seen yet. Nothing is off limits. The only thing stopping him at this point is his own imagination. That is the beauty of Minecraft. That is everything Minecraft is meant to be. I think this journey, especially for new players, cannot be forgotten. But I've only shown you one story. A story that represents what Minecraft is meant to be for a single individual. It is his story and his experience. There was much he did not see, much that he did not do, because to him, the most important thing was to create and to make things his own. It is likely that he'll play it again and try new things, and his knowledge will expand because of that. Imagine for a moment, another player. She's been playing Minecraft for a little bit now, and she understands the basics of the main progression. She's in the same world for a few months, she's made a quaint little house, got a nice set of netherite armor, and even defeated the Ender Dragon, but she's grown tired of mining for materials and keeping track of her various farms. She's bored of the simple homestead, so she spends hours researching and learning the complexities of redstone, hoping that she can somewhat automate this process. She learns how to create farms that can do all the hard work for her. Once this is done, she can relax and work on expanding her home. She upgrades villages and protects them with the light and fortifications to keep them safe from the undead. She's an experienced player, and while the mechanics of the game are not new, she still finds a way to enjoy the game as she discovers and shifts her goals to continue her journey. But let's imagine another player, one who's playing the game for, let's say over a decade. They're tired. With every new update, they begin to lose hope for the future of the game. 
And it seems like every new controversy, every half-thought-out mechanic is closing in on them, forcing them into a box. What was once a game of endless creativity and joy has become something stale. They've seen it all. They've climbed the tallest mountains and ventured down to the darkest caves. They've defeated the Ender Dragon more times than they can count. In hardcore, too. They've played adventure maps, multiplayer, and mods. They've tried different texture packs and shaders to make the game look different, but to them, it's just not enough. Minecraft has been a staple in their life for over a decade. How did it become so far from the magical experience of their childhood? Had they become complacent in their world, not willing to venture out of their comfort zone? Is it their fault? Is it the fault of the game? Perhaps this is what growing up entails. They have forgotten the importance of that first tree. They have forgotten the magic of the endless sandbox. And while it's sad to see, perhaps this player should leave the game for a while, take some space. Perhaps they need a break. If they choose to never play the game again, that's okay. Games are not meant to be played forever. At some point, each one of us will either adapt or move on, and either choice is completely valid. But if we choose to sit in perpetual discomfort for fear of making the wrong decision, we will only hurt ourselves. This player, dear friends, this player is hurting. They remember the countless friends they've made over the years, and the countless friends they've lost, the houses built, the battles won and lost. They can see them in their memory, sure, but it's cold. It's a cold memory. One without feeling. And the truth is, I'm all three of these players. I was the naive kid who went into the world without a care or expectation. I was the experienced player who didn't want to go through the hassle of grinding. And I was the player who felt like their time with the game was over. But there was nothing else that could really revive that sense of wonder and joy I used to feel. In many ways, I'm willing to bet that some of you have been all three of these players too at some point. The experience of a long-time Minecraft player can vary widely, but I tried to pick a few scenarios that could branch out as far as possible. So when I made that video about Minecraft's progression a few months ago, I have to ask myself, what kind of a player was I? Had I lost sight of what made Minecraft special? Had I lost my sense of creativity and joy? And you might know the answer, but I think I kind of did. Watching that video is actually kind of hard for me. Weirdly, I think I was venting out my frustrations with YouTube and the path that I was going down. Back then, I was doing like three video essays a week, and that that was pretty hard. I felt a need to just make tons of content without realizing that I could probably make better content if I just slowed down. I made tons of content because I felt pressured. I wanted to make sure you guys had plenty to watch for me. That 1.21 video was a massive risk I took. I had an idea for it, and I... I don't know if I got lucky or if it was just a really good move at the right time. And because of that, I pushed myself too hard. I felt a lot of resentment because I was tired. I was sick of making Minecraft videos. <laughs> that's why playing Vintage Story came right after that, and that's why I was so happy to play it. But then, something happened as a result of that progression video. My subscriber count doubled, and now it's even gone more than that. A, a lot of people agreed with that video. And that felt good. Even now, I think I made multiple well-thought-out and valid arguments in that video. Nonetheless, a lot of the comments got me thinking. I spent too much time arguing it out with people who disagree with my take instead of digesting what they were saying. I tried to stick to the comments that seemed to be genuine rebuttals that came out of a place of respect and, and not hate. People who just said things like, L take, were clearly not there to have real discussions, but the people who said, good video, but here's why I think you're wrong. Those. Those are the people that I listen to. Those are the people I love hearing from. Those are the comments that stick with me while I work on my part-time job or write other video essays. So, is Minecraft's progression bad? Kinda? Not, not really? My progression in Minecraft was learning how the game works on a fairly deep level. I mean, I can't work code worth jack shit, so my knowledge is limited, but I know what it means to make something that people will enjoy. When my server Elysium Isles was open, it peaked at around 830-ish members in the Discord. Now that server's closed and it's dropped down by about 110 people or so, but that's still 720-ish people who are waiting for me to either reopen the server or release it as a map, and that's pretty insane to me. There are so many people who want to experience Minecraft in a new way, in a way that isn't just the same vanilla progression over and over again. That's beautiful to me. My progression in Minecraft is my own, in the same way that your progression in Minecraft is your own. If I feel bored with the game, it's likely because I'm not challenging myself enough. If I feel as though it's getting old or just tiring, it's usually because I'm tired and I'm old. Oh wait, no, I'm not. Wait. As I said earlier, I think a lot of the solutions I listed in that original video are still valid, 
and as evidenced by the fact that, you know, not to brag, Mojang has been implementing things that line up closely or one-to-one -one with what I asked for in that progression video. In that sense, I feel extremely vindicated. But it's kind of like you get the correct answer, but you came to that answer in the wrong way. It's like when you know the answer to a math question, but you don't know how to prove it, so you just kind of bullshit your way through the problem, hoping your teacher doesn't notice that you just made that mistake because she wants you to, like, show your work or something. I'm not saying I intentionally bullshitted my arguments. N no, not, not at all. Rather, I think I came up with solutions first and then tried to figure out what the problem was after. I think I worked at it in the wrong direction. So, I'm gonna try to fix that. I'm going to tell you what I think is wrong with Minecraft and then give a direct solution to that issue. Once again, I want to preface this by saying this is my opinion. People often have different ideas when it comes to game design, and I welcome debate, but dear god, do not tell me I'm missing the point of Minecraft because I just spent the last however fucking many minutes trying to prove that I understand Minecraft. Let's start with mending and villagers. You all know how I feel about this one, but I promise I have something new to say here, and I apologize in advance if this is stuff you've kind of heard before from me. I think it's objectively bad game design if RNG is the sole way players get enchantments, especially like the best ones in the game. Doubly so in a game like Minecraft where you emphasize player freedom. I see a lot of people saying that the 1.14 villager update fixed mending because players were no longer relying on RNG or fishing or end city loot to get mending, but this is wrong. Like you're still using RNG. Breaking lecterns over and over until you get mending is RNG. There's no skill required in it. It's just you're doing it over and over and over again until you get it. You're just replacing the RNG with another form of RNG. With the experimental villager changes, this issue is fixed entirely. There is no more RNG. Swamp villager librarians now have a 100% chance of giving mending. Yet there are still some issues with the system. Knowing that getting your hands on a swamp villager can be a bit, well, let's be real here, a huge pain in the ass. I think the biggest issue comes down to the actual moving of villagers. We've solved the RNG issue, sure, that's good, but we've created a new one. They can't be led with leads for pretty obvious reasons, and using boats is janky, so most players will likely just wait around in a swamp for a zombie villager to spawn rather than go through the work of transporting villagers. This isn't great, however, if, if I'm going to be brutally honest with you, if you're not willing to put the work in, why would you then feel entitled to the best enchantment in the game? Mending is, without a doubt, the enchantment that every player needs. Why shouldn't that take some work? I think people just get this idea in their head that they need mending and they need it now, so doing any real work for it is too hard and they don't want to rely on RNG to get it for them. Which is like, you can't really have your cake and eat it too, you know? You can't really oven when you out of the hot food cold eat the food, you know? You gotta pick your poison. And if you don't like the villager changes, you don't have to turn them on. It's an opt-in change as of now. Mojang has been listening to community feedback as of late and will likely make changes to the new system in the future. If you don't like this system, make your voice heard. Not to me though. I, I don't need more comments telling me how bad these changes are. Like, I get it. You don't like it. I know. Take those opinions to Mojang themselves. I promise they'll listen to it. I don't give a shit. The other criticism I heard of my original argument was that I didn't have to make villager breeding farms and slave camps. Correct. That's true. It's a good thing I never said anyone had to do it, right? But there is this weird hypocrisy in Mojang's policies. Like, they won't add fireflies to the game because in real life they kill some species of frogs, but they'll let us kill parrots with cookies, and then they'll also let us make borderline slavery breeding camps? Does that not feel a little weird to you? It's so morally inconsistent for a game meant for all audiences that prides itself on the safety measures they've taken for young people. See censoring of swear words in Bedrock Edition and like chat reporting for proof of that. So here is a direct solution to this issue. Make villagers easier to move and keep the experimental villager changes. How can we make it easier to move villagers? Bells. Every livestock mob in Minecraft can be led around via some kind of a plant. You can hold the plant in your hand and the mob will follow. Pretty simple stuff. Just do this with villagers and bells. You can extend the following distance, like 10 blocks or so that they don't fall behind as easily, and just have villagers follow you wherever you need to go. Push them into a boat, push them into a swamp, do whatever you need to do to get them there. Is it like herding livestock? No, not at all. I don't know why you would think this is the same thing at all. But if that deters you, you can make it so they're only able to go when you give them gifts like crops and whatnot, so they have a reason to go with you. I know what you're thinking. Doesn't this just incentivize slavery camps? No, not any more than Minecraft currently does. It just makes it easier to get the villagers moved around. 
If you want a solution to the slavery issue, I think Terraria Deadass has a pretty good solution to this that I think we can adapt. Give villagers a certain amount of space they need to feel comfortable. My solution here is what I'm calling the comfort meter. Ideally, there would be like several factors that impact this comfort meter. Here's a list of a few things that I think could be possible factors. Villagers need a minimum of a 5x5 five five interior house to be comfortable. The house needs a door, a light, a bed, and a workstation. The villager must be able to leave the house and reach a nearby bell. There would be a minimum and maximum number of nearby villagers for the villager to feel comfortable. An iron golem should be present. A villager should live within a 30 block cuboid radius of a bell. Again, these are just some factors that I could kind of think of off the top of my head. I'm sure you can come up with different ones. And you might be saying, I thought you don't want Minecraft to be more like Terraria. Well, if you know anything about the NPC system in Terraria, you'll know that what I've just described is way different. Not even close to the same thing, but someone's going to say in the comments, so I want to preemptively get to it. If a villager's comfort meter is high, they should have cheaper prices and more stock. If a villager's comfort meter is low, they should have higher prices. Additionally, villagers may not be as willing to sell things to the player if their comfort is too low. This system forces people to not do slavery if they want good prices. Is it fucked up that players need a monetary incentive to avoid slavery? Maybe, but that's where the player base is at. They could make this all into the experimental changes to ensure that everyone has the option to play the game as they want. They could take this opportunity to really listen to the community. But Garrett, I hear you typing. Uh, by the way, you have a nice keyboard. It's really good, but you maybe could upgrade a little bit, but it's really good though. Wouldn't this alienate new players and make it harder for them? Not really. Like, how fucking hard is it to build a 5x5 five five house and stick some basic shit in it? An 8-year-old could figure that out. Are you going to tell me that's complicated when the game includes things like potion crafting, which is literally impossible to figure out without googling it or having prior knowledge? No, I don't buy it. You could add things to a game to make them slightly more challenging or deep, and people will learn it. Or as many of my detractors like to argue, you could just not do it. So I think my solution here is flawless. I would give you the choice to have it turned on or off. Moving on from villagers, overall there is a bit of an imbalance between the challenges and rewards in Minecraft. I mentioned this in my original follow-up video to part one of this series. Is it a series now? I, I don't know. I don't think so. My issue here is that things like the basic dungeons and ruined nether portals offer greater loot than things like ocean monuments when compared to the amount of work that's required to conquer either one. I apologize to anyone who's watched my original video, but I'm gonna say it again. Ocean monuments kind of suck in terms of rewards unless you really love to build with prismarine or need sponge for a specific project. They're a pain in the ass to get through, and compared to the loot you can get from a ruined nether portal, I'd sooner loot 15 ruined nether portals than 15 ocean monuments. The things you can get from a ruined nether portal are like invaluable compared to the quirky souvenirs of, of gold from an ocean monument. You can get things like gold blocks, golden gear, golden apples, golden carrots, glistening mounts, flint and steel, like even iron nuggets. Like, what do you get from an ocean monument? Prismarine, uh, one armor trim, and sponge? Well, yes, yeah, sponge is admittedly useful for certain projects, but it's like really situational. And I'll say it again, if you don't like Prismarine, going through one of these things for the armor trim isn't really worth the hassle if you ask me. Now, I'm going to predict another comment, so bear with me. It's Being a psychic is kind of hard. But you don't have to go through the ocean monuments. This is true, but I don't have to go through any structure in Minecraft, so what's your point? The imbalance still exists whether I choose to partake in it or not. That's like saying, yeah, the burgers at this restaurant are assed and cost too much, but you can just eat the chicken wings instead, so stop bitching. Like, that doesn't make the burgers any less shitty. Thank you for reminding me that my options are limited. The obvious solution to this problem is to add like barrels or chests or even vaults to the ocean monuments. Let these chests have nautilus shells or prismine shards and crystals or better yet, do what was done with the trial chambers. Give a unique piece of gear. Perhaps a pieces of a faster prismarine themed boat? Perhaps pieces of an ancient fishing rod with the capabilities and durability above that of a normal rod? You don't need to go to this option for fishing, but it's something you can do if you want to. That's literally what Minecraft is all about. The option to do more without forcing it. The turtle shell, the trident, and now the mace prove that people clearly enjoy unique pieces of gear like this, and clearly Mojang does too, so why not add a few more of these around? They do nothing but add to the world in fun ways. They give you reasons to explore. I cannot possibly think of how this harms the game. Clutter? Bloat? They're going to keep adding things to the game anyway. Might as well make the bloat and clutter worth a shit. But none of this matters at all if getting to those unique items is piss easy, or at least piss easy for the experienced players. And knowing how easily things can be cheesed in Minecraft, it would be easy. 
For those of you who don't know, so many of the problems with Minecraft's challenges come down to poor hostile mob AI. These fellows are easily manipulated into being trapped or attacking each other. It happens far too often. I suggested in my original progression video that skeletons shooting each other shouldn't always result in them turning to each other. This can be toggled like with difficulty. The harder the game is, the less likely a skeleton shot by another skeleton would be then turned to shoot another skeleton. Wait, hold on. Sorry, that's a dumb sentence. Let me let me try that again. In the case of friendly fire amongst the bony brothers, calcium cousins, if you will, um, the odds of the victim, sh <laughs> the odds of the victim in this situation turning to shoot the suspect should be decreased as the player ups the difficulty. There. Okay, I think that makes sense. <laughs> I think. In easy mode, it's 100%. They will always turn on each other. In normal mode, 50%. Hard mode, 25. Hardcore, zero. I think this is a great system, but I want to add to it. Apply this same sort of system to being trapped in the boats. Whenever a mob is near a boat, it can be trapped inside that boat. This can be done for most hostile mobs in the game. Zombies, creepers, skeletons, weather skeletons, etc. Pretty much anything close to human-sized. This, for obvious reasons, kills any sort of real challenge when fighting a mob. Like, oh, you've got some wither skeletons coming your way? Just throw them in a boat and just watch them sit there and do nothing. There are two solutions to this issue that I think could help. The first one is sort of a, a mirror to the skeleton AI system. Mobs have a chance every 20 ticks or so to escape a boat. In easy mode, this percentage is zero. It'll always stay in the boat. In normal difficulty, it goes to 25. In hard, it's 50%. In hardcore, it's 100. This means as you go up in the difficulty, the more likely it is that a mob will break free from the boat you've trapped them in. I think this should destroy the boat in the process, making the item plop under the floor right next to them, so the player will have to fight the mob to, to get it back. Alternatively, if this is too much on performance, I could see how mobs checking for if they're in a boat every fucking second could kill performance knowing how shitty Minecraft is coded. I could see this being turned to just a game rule, something like hostile mob vehicle trapping, true or false. When a player puts a boat down near a zombie, they should just not get in the boat. They'll just go around it or avoid it. And while we're on this topic, I think water buckets and lava buckets can also really easily ruin challenges, but I think if a player has the smarts to bring a lava bucket to a trial chamber and alike, they should be allowed to run the risk of getting ricocheted into their own lava. It's sort of a form of cheesing that shouldn't be taken out considering the skill and risk that comes with it. Overall, I think all these changes could be implemented in different ways. Giving players the option to opt in or out is always the best thing you can do. People don't want to be forced into a new system. I understand that. So give them that choice. That's something Vintage Story does really well. You have the option to really customize your game. These are my opinions though, and I want to be clear that this is my subjective idea of what should be done. As I said earlier though, looking at a few recent snapshots lately, ah, they're kind of doing what I said they should do, I feel pretty good about it. But what is Minecraft's biggest problem? What is the one thing that I think could help the game's longevity? Unfortunately, bear with me here, I think it's um, I think it's some of us. The Minecraft community online can be very toxic. There's a lot of hate that gets thrown Mojang's way for various decisions over the years, or Microsoft for buying the game and ruining it or whatever, but like, it's a game. And these people are doing their jobs. I know many of you are too young to have jobs, but walking up to a random Walmart worker and saying shit like, you're lazy and you suck at your job is kind of a bad thing to do. It kind of makes you a bad person. Even when they do make a mistake, it's still bad to do that. That's what so many people do to game developers and they don't realize how hard it is to make games and keep up with a community that is constantly evolving. The game devs and the players should be on the same team. The developers want to sell more copies. The players want the game to continue succeeding. It should be a win-win strategy. There are ways to critique a piece of art without being mean to the artist. There is no need to get so personal with it. Some of you let your emotional ties to Minecraft cloud your mind and you forget that people make games, not corporations. I think everyone needs to take a step back and appreciate how much Mojang does. A lot of people call them lazy, but since 2009, Mojang has released dozens of free updates to the game. And here's a fun fact, if you don't like the latest update, you don't have to play it. There are plenty of people who refuse to update beyond, I don't know, 1.12 or, or 1.8, or how some refuse to play beyond beta 1.7. And each form of play is perfectly valid and fine. If Minecraft is going down a path you don't like, don't update your game. And if you're a bedrock player on, on a console or a phone, just ignore the new features if you can. Mojang rarely adds something that players are required to interact with. I, I mean, seriously, think about it. What features are you forced to interact with outside of world generation changes? Almost none, really. Don't like Netherite? 
don't use it. It's entirely optional. Don't like trial chambers? Don't go in them. Don't care for the experimental villager rebalancing? Keep it turned off. You have that choice. Just play the game you want it to be played. And if you don't like the new updates, stay on an older version and use mods to freshen up your experience. But if you're a Bedrock player, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. You're just kind of, you're kind of shit out of luck there. I apologize. I guess you could pay for mods. Ha <laughs> ha! You want Minecraft to be fun again? Try creating something. Instead of being an enjoyer of someone else's creation, try to create yourself. I promise you, you have so many good ideas in your brain, so many creative experiences waiting to be set free. If you have all these thoughts and opinions about what Minecraft should be, then go make it. The only thing that's preventing you from attempting this is yourself. I mean, I mean, really think about it. The time you've spent watching this video, you instead could have learned how to begin to code or how to build, how to use mods or whatever it may be. You have time. That's not to say that you should always be trying to make something new and unique or fix a problem you have with the game. Obviously, that's unrealistic and you are allowed to offer criticism. There is a lot of value in taking time to just be without a goal. It may not mean a lot to you right now, but if what bothers you is something that you're truly passionate about, you'll make time. You'll find the time to do something because you love it. When we create art, we put a bit of ourselves into whatever it is. That's the beauty of it. There's always a bit of personal touch to it. So go do it. Make your own creations. It doesn't have to be within Minecraft either. Just go make something. Make a YouTube video. Make a new recipe. Make yourself stronger. Make yourself the person you know you can be. Your art is your own. Don't compare it to others. There is no objective way to look at it. In this life, you have limited time. Why waste that time doing something you don't love? Just make something, and I'm sure it'll be great. Thank you so much for watching this video. I, I know you were probably expecting me to take a dump on Minecraft like I've kind of done in the past, but at the end of the day, I think the issue is ourselves sometimes. We make Minecraft what we want it to be. We all make art what we want it to be, and I think above all else, Minecraft has given me the creative opportunities to express myself and the ideas that I could, never could have without it. And one final note, it's okay to stop playing Minecraft. If you're upset with the game or bored of it, it's okay to quit for a while. You don't have to play this game forever. If you make content about Minecraft, it's okay to branch out. It may not get the same views or bring in the same money, trust me, I know, but it's okay. If you're passionate about something, that passion will show and people will care. It may not be the same amount of people. It may not be as immediate, but people will see it. They'll see the love in what you make. I hope you've seen the love in what I make. I'm really excited to make more content for you guys. I love it. If you want to support my work, you can consider liking and subscribing. If you want to support me more directly, consider becoming a member. It's like three bucks a month. It's like a soda, dude. You can get access to all of my video essays early, uh, as well as get full live stream VODs. I stream every Saturday. I, I am moving this week, though, so I may not get to this weekend. If you can't afford a membership, that's understandable. Don't worry. I'm going to be uploading stream highlights on my second channel on Wednesdays from now on. This basically means that you'll be getting three bits of content from me per week. You get the main video essay, a live stream, and a compilation that week. So, of course, if you're a member, you get to see all that stuff early, but a like and a subscription works just as well. So, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys all in the next one. Bye-bye.